Okay, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is David Anderson. I've lived in Boston for about four years or so. I'm Matthew Milioni's son-in-law, so that might be a reference point. But I was asked to speak some on discipleship. And specifically, the title is Radical Discipleship. It could also be called Miscellaneous Thoughts on Discipleship. So hopefully, hopefully the radical will get in there at some point. Um, but I think part of the reason was part of my testimony was um, involved a lot of like cutting off and leaving, kind of some of those radical commands of Jesus when he says, he who's not willing to forsake father, mother, brother, sister, son, daughter, is not worthy of me. The disciples who immediately left their nets and followed after Christ. I was raised in the United Methodist Church, and in fifth grade, I remember reading those passages and thinking, wow, I'm glad that these passages don't apply anymore. <laughs> like, these sound very scary, and I don't know if I would ever be able to do them. That was around fifth grade, because I'd never seen anyone do them. Um, about 10, 12 years later, all of a sudden I realized, wait, those passages are for all people, for all time. Um, so it involved leaving, in some way, family, background, goals, dreams, aspirations, comfort, security. But all that to say, like, that's not necessarily irregular. Like, I know there's at least several of you here who have the same testimony. And so I don't feel the most qualified to share, but I'm hoping that what I do have to share can be a blessing. Um, so I just want to open up and ask, what is a disciple? I've been here for about, what? three or four days, do we have a working definition of discipleship? Yes. Okay. Someone said yes. What's the working definition of discipleship? Someone that allows Jesus access to their whole life. Someone that allows Jesus access to their whole life. Do we have anything to add to that? Do we agree with that? Is that a good, is that our working definition here? Okay. Perfect. Someone who allows Jesus to have access to their whole life. It's a great definition. So, I want to open up with another question. How can we know God? How can we learn about God? How can we know more about God? Opening the question up to any, any thoughts you may have. What are ways that you personally come to know God? What are ways you've seen other people um, use to know who God is, what he's like? So, um, I'm going to go over here first. Walking with him. Walking with him. That's... Great. Walking with God is a way to learn about God. What else? Spending time with him and seeking his face. Spending time with him and seeking his face, almost as if he is a person, a relationship that you can build, and you spend time with somebody face to face, and you grow to learn them more. What else? What are some other ways? Yes. Reading his word. Perfect. Perfect. And along with reading his word, um, doing the parts you understand. You may not understand everything completely at the beginning, but do the parts you understand. Perfect. So, not just reading his word, but doing the parts that you understand. Joshua? Putting your trust in him. Putting, putting your trust in him as a way to learn more about him. Okay. What else? Worshiping him. Yeah, like actually singing to him. Actually, like praising him and thanking him. Like, yeah, that's Yeah, worshiping him and singing to him. I like that. It really preserves the idea of God as a person that we can cultivate a relationship with. Um, I'm going to go Elijah and then over here. Okay, looking for his image in the world around us and people around us. I, I find it to make room for him to have to die to self. Mm -hmm. or, okay, making room for him, which means making less room for us, dying to self. Um, this is somewhat rhetorical, but uh, for me it's Jesus. Like Jesus' life helps me understand God. Perfect. Jesus' life helps us understand God. Okay, so that's all fantastic. I want to open up by reading Isaiah chapter 58. Um, so I'm going to read the whole chapter. So definitely turn there, follow along. I'll be reading out of New King James. Um, and what we're going to talk about here is going to definitely touch on some of those, um, some of those points you brought up. And the very fact that we're opening up scripture means we're reading God's word as a way to know him. So we've already started off well. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and start reading. This is Isaiah chapter 58. 
Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways. As a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God, they ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching God. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice? In fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers. Indeed, you fast for strife and debate and to strike with the fist of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. Is it a fast I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to, spin, and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is this not the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out, when you see the naked that you cover him, and hide yourself, and hide not yourself from your own flesh? Then your light shall break forth like the morning, your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, and spreading wickedness, if you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness, and your darkness shall be as the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Those from among you shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. So there's a lot going on in that, and that actually touches several points that we brought up. It touches seeking the face of God, which we all ought to do, but there's some times when it seemed Israel was seeking the face of God, and God found it displeasurable, to say the least. Where they're fasting, they're afflicting themselves, trying to find the face of God, and yet God views it as repugnant. He doesn't like it. He says, this is not what I wanted. And what does he want? And we're gonna, this is going to be a framework for some of what we have to talk about today, but some of what Elijah had said, to see the image of God in other people, to go find other people, to ease their afflictions, to ease their burdens, to bring in the poor, to not hide from your own flesh. So just keep all of that in mind when we talk about what does it mean to know God. There's a lot of if-then statements in Isaiah 58. If you do this, then the light will break forth. If you do this, then the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. I think another passage about knowing God is actually found in the Beatitudes. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Sorry, nope, wrong one. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So Jesus is saying that there's a way that we can see God, and I hope we all see God working in some aspects every day, but if you're like me, you don't see God all the time in everything you do, constantly in front of his face, and Jesus is saying that's due to some sort of lack of purity. So I want to really capture on that. Blessed are the pure in heart, because those are the type of people that are going to see God. Those are the type of people that are going to know God, and understand him, see how he moves, see how he works. They're going to see God. 
for those who are not pure in heart, your vision of God will be hazy, to say the least, and perhaps entirely absent. So, that begs the question, what does it mean to purify yourself? What does it mean to be pure in heart? So I'm going to open that up. What are some thoughts? This is an open-ended idea. What does it mean to purify yourself? If our goal is to see God and to know God, what does it mean to purify our hearts in order to do that? Any thoughts? Yes. Single-mindedness. Single-mindedness. Perfect. Um, One of the original ideas of purity is like metals. It's just 100% a certain metal. It's not defiled with any sort of other metal. Like pure gold is 100% gold. And so single-mindedness, I think, is a perfect idea. What else? If someone that you're working through discipleship with is asking, they just read this passage and they're like, okay, that sounds nice, but these are just weird concepts. What does it actually mean to purify myself? What would you say? Examine yourself. Examine yourself. Remove anything anything that's um, not like God. Remove anything that's not like God. So we have examine yourself, remove anything that's not like God, be single-minded. Any others? Dumb. Okay, a lack of distraction, a clarity. I think these are all great ideas of what it means to purify yourself. Um, When you're thinking about, this isn't the only way to understand it, but scripture, the New Testament actually gives a picture of what it means to purify yourself. That gives a lot of pictures, but one of them for our purposes, I really hope that you can, if there's anything that I say that you keep um, going forward from here, is this link between the pure in heart and 1 Peter 1.22. Um, I can read it. You can turn there if you want. It's just a single verse. Peter is addressing the saints, and he writes this. Since you have purified yourselves, so since you've purified yourselves, by obeying the truth for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. I'll read that again. Since you have purified yourselves, By obeying the truth for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. So, Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And Peter says, at least least for Peter, purifying yourself looks like obedience to truth. And specifically for love of the brethren. So, I hope you can see what that looks like. I want to propose a way to know God, and some of you had already mentioned it, so you're already a step ahead of some of this talk, is through obedience. That we cannot know God without obedience. And this is specifically addressed, finally, in one more passage regarding this, in John 14, 21. And again, I'll read it, so you don't have to turn there, but you can. Jesus says, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. So first, what does it mean to love Jesus? It actually means more than just an emotional sentiment. It means to keep his commands. The one who loves me will be loved by my father, and I too will love them and show myself to them and manifest myself to them. So we have Jesus himself saying, who, if you want to just put a dot, dot, dot between those, it's whoever has my commands and keeps them, I will show myself to them. So, in all of these pictures of what does it mean to know God, what does it mean to know more about God, at least one way to approach that is keeping Jesus' commands, obeying the truth that we have in front of us, and specifically as it pertains to love of the brethren, which Jesus commands later on in the Gospel of John. He says that's actually the new command that he's delivering. So my first point is radical discipleship is how we know God. Radical discipleship is how we know God. There's a sense in that you have to know something of God to start, 
but I want to invert the idea that you start to know a lot of things about God and you build up this giant, um, this body of knowledge about God and then make the decision, do I want to follow him or do I want to keep following him? That scripturally speaking, that's not how it works. We don't build up this whole knowledge of like, who is God? I know he's this, this, and this, and I've analyzed who he is. And based off of that, I'm going to choose to follow him or not. That it's actually the other way around. It's I choose to follow him. And because of that, I know him. And I know more of him. So, all of that to say that the spiritual world is different than the world that we sometimes inhabit on a day-to-day -day basis. And what I mean by that is the scriptures say that the kingdom of God is not in word, but in deed or power. I don't have the reference for that, but scripture saith in a certain place. Um, but it's not in word, it's in deed or action or power. Anytime we see the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, Doing anything in scripture, it's action, it's creativity. In Genesis 1, we see the spirit hovering over the waters of creation. And we know that through Christ and the spirit, all things are created. Does anybody know, happen to know who the first person in the Bible is that was said to be filled with the spirit? A trivia question. Who's the first person in the Bible to be said to be filled with the Spirit. Okay. I won't push it any longer. Well, Clark? Was it Moses? Moses, no, it was not Moses. Was it Samson? It was not Samson. Unfor what? Joseph. Joseph, that is the first person in the Bible that Pharaoh says the Spirit of God is in them. And so that's, I would say that's a right answer with an asterisk. <laughs> um, is it Jephthah? Nope, not Jephthah. So. Adam, nope, unfortunately. <laughs> we just keep Jesus, no, nope, we'll just keep going. What? <laughs> um, I think Exodus. I'll, okay, I'll spare you guys. So the first person to explicitly be said to be filled with the Spirit is Bezalel. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> who, who here can tell me who Bezalel was? Is it Deborah? What? Is it Deborah's? Nope. Okay, sorry. I'll, I'll Boom, there we go. He was the guy that helped build the tabernacle. He was a craftsman. The very first instance of the Spirit of God filling someone is empowering them to act and to create. He was filled with the Spirit of God so that he could build the tabernacle, all of these things that Moses saw on the mountain. And I think it's important because that's how the Spirit works. It's not through abstract knowledge, detaching yourself, learning a bunch of things about things. It's action. The kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. We see uh, the spirit in Isaiah 41 moving around the dry earth and creating vegetation wherever he goes. The spirit creates new creatures out of us when we are adopted as sons and daughters of the father. So all of this to be said, we learn, the way we learn in the spiritual world is different than the way we learn. Like I'm a college student right now. I go and I learn and I take in a lot of facts and that's valid, that's useful, but that's not how things work spiritually. The way we learn spiritually is through action, through acting, through going out in the world and doing. Every action that we do creates a new state of being for us. It, every action puts us a step further in our twisting and turning pathway of life. And spiritually speaking, that's how we learn. <coughs> so to condense all this in a metaphor, this is from C.S. Lewis, but he talks about someone standing in a woodshed and it's a very dark woodshed. It's daytime outside. The way he knows that is because there's a little crack, little, little window where a bunch of light is coming in. And so you can see if I'm standing here and this circle is the light, I'm gonna see this light coming in. But if I had to describe what's out there, I can't tell you. No amount of sitting here and thinking is ever going to get me to be able to tell you what's out there. I'm never going to have knowledge of what is outside of the shed. So what's the way that we have knowledge? 
of it, what's out there. Yeah, if the door's open, going out and experiencing it. And if not, stepping into the light and looking out. And so all of a sudden, when we take a step into the light, when we take a step of obedience, that's how we start to learn. That's how we start to learn who God is, what his purposes are. So the way we purify ourselves in order to see God is through obedience to the truth. And so that's what Peter tells us. And I can attest, it's a disorienting and dizzying world as soon as you start to get this framework in your mind. Like as soon as you start to act and truly make decisions, I actually can think of only like five to 10 like full decisions that I've ever made where it's not just kind of like going from one thing to the other and you know, you get in this pace of life where it's just the next thing, the next thing. It's like all of life is pushing you one way and to actually take a step back and decide, is this the way I want to go and making decisions that might change that. I've only made a few decisions like that, but that is what is required for Christians that we do make those decisions. And so, I want you to take a moment, just quietly amongst yourselves, and think about your life, and think about some of those big decisions that you've made, that it's not just going with the flow, just being dragged along. Times where you stepped back and evaluated, to the best of your knowledge, what you knew, and then made a decision and acted. So think about those times and then think about what was revealed to you after that. So just ponder your life real quick for a minute or so. Think of the major decisions in your life. We'll do some more of this during the time of prayer after this, but I hope that at least for several of you, at least most of you, I hope for all of you, the decisions you've made in life have opened up new things you never thought of, have given you more knowledge than you ever thought of. Like, that's the point that I'm wanting to hit home over and over and over, that knowledge of God, discipleship, all of these things isn't taking a step back and analyzing, it's taking a step in and acting. In every single step that we take with Christ, he reveals more and more of himself, and that's what he promises us. He says, if you keep my commandments, I will reveal myself to you over and over and over. We get a picture of that, that our life shouldn't be stagnant, that we're to be transformed into the image of Christ, degree and degree of glory by glory by glory by glory, and that only happens through obedience, through discipleship. Through is the definition of discipleship. Um, I want to get the exact wording right, so I'll throw it back to Dom real quick. <laughs> so this only happens through giving Jesus access to your entire life and by acting on those things that he's putting his finger on. So the implications of this idea, I'm hoping, like this one huge major point is that radical discipleship is how we know God. Purification is how we see God and obedience is how we purify ourselves, the implications are by not obeying, we will never know God. By not obeying, our knowledge of God hits a cap. Whatever command is given that Jesus says, but also in the entirety of scripture, because it's the same God who breathed out scripture, whatever command that we're lacking in is the cap for how much we know about God. <coughs> This actually works for, um, I know you've had sessions on making disciples, but this works for when you're walking someone through the process of discipleship and becoming a disciple of Jesus in telling them that there's no place where you're going to know the entirety of who God is, where you can make an ob objective decision to follow after God that doesn't exist. The only way you know is by stepping into it. So something like baptism, if someone's not baptized, there's a limit set on how much they can know about God. Until there's a step of obedience, they're still looking at the light. Until you take a step and see through, there's a limit on how much you can know about God. If there are things you're refusing that you know consciously, you've set a cap on how much you can know about God. 
you know, all of the studying and all of the books in the world won't have you know more about God spiritually in the way that God would want to be known. So. Okay, cool. I know I'm just throwing a lot of stuff out there. I'm seeing, okay, I think we're all on the same page. Another point in this idea of obedience as the way of knowing God is that sometimes we don't know why. We don't know why Jesus gives a certain commandment. We don't know why God gives a certain commandment. It might seem foolish. Oftentimes it does. The scriptures tell us that, that he's chosen the weak and foolish things of the world to show his glory. So it's going to seem very confusing sometimes, but that's not an excuse not to obey. Um, Ezekiel chapter 8, verse, verse 8. You don't have to turn there again. It's a single verse. I can read it. But it's a profound verse for what discipleship is. And it's a, it's a kind of funny sounding verse. I'll read it to you. God is talking to Ezekiel and he says, Son of man, dig in the wall. So I dug in the wall. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Son of man, dig in the wall. So I dug in the wall. And that captures what discipleship is that captures what obedience is and through that faithful action the rest of Ezekiel starts to play out and more revelation is given and the whole church is edified and it's this beautiful picture of what happens when we obey even when it seems confusing even when it seems arbitrary so think of that whenever you're encountering some of these passages son of man dig in the wall dig in the wall also, if you think in 2 Peter, it talks about this chain of like, add to this, this, add to this, this. Are you guys familiar with that chain? Add to knowledge, add to all this stuff. The very first thing in that chain, do you guys remember what it is? It's not knowledge. It's actually faith. So you start with faith. And then the very second thing is you add to your faith knowledge. You add to your faith knowledge. And so again, it's the same theme over and over and over that you start with faith, you start with obedience, you start with action, and then knowledge comes. And again, all of this, it's like asking somebody what it's like to be underneath a massive waterfall of freezing cold water who's never actually done that. You can talk around it, you can read some accounts of what that might look like, but you'll never actually know until you step in and feel the water pouring over you and feel the freezing, exhilarating experience of stepping into this waterfall. So it's the same idea of stepping in faith, stepping in obedience. Um, so that's the first implication of this idea, is that if our cap of obedience is our cap on the knowledge of God, our cap of obedience is our cap of how much we can know about God. Our second implication is that radical discipleship is continuous. And I hope that's not a shocking claim. I'm expecting that most of us would agree with that, but I really want to dive into that. Because if we're supposed to be transformed degree by degree into glory, and if there's supposed to be this upward movement into the knowledge and glory of God, it means that we have to keep obeying for Jesus to keep manifesting himself, keep stepping out, stepping out, stepping out. So radical discipleship is continuous. For those of you who are baptized, that was often based like on obedience. You see this command, you step into that, and then you move into that next phase of the spiritual life. And all of a sudden you have access to the church, you have access to the sacraments. And as you're faithful there, you step into more places and you have more experiences and you have more knowledge. And so participation in the church and participation in God is continuous. And as we cease obeying, even for somebody who has spent 30 years in productive ministry and baptized hundreds of people, planted churches, the degree to, that, the degree to which that person stops obeying is that person's cap on the knowledge of God. No more revelation will be given. And so we can still know lots about God, but our growth ceases. And as our growth continues to cease, as we start to wither away, if that happens too much, it actually becomes a very dangerous situation. Jesus talks about the branches withering away and not bearing fruit, not bearing action in the world, that eventually they actually get cut off and cast away. And so not only does our knowledge of God stop growing, but it starts to wither 
in its entirely, entirety. So one of the practical takeaways of this idea of radical discipleship being continuous is something that's helped me a lot over my Christian life is to search for commandments to obey. Search the scriptures for commandments to obey. Proverbs 2, 4, um, paraphrased, it says, look for wisdom like hidden treasure. Look for wisdom like silver. You imagine like all of these treasure hunters out there like toiling and straining and sweating, trying to find this amazing amount of treasure that will change their life forever. And the writer of Proverbs is saying, take that mentality and apply it to wisdom and apply it to the scriptures. And that was actually a pivotal verse for me, um, leaving a lot of what I had known and stepping into this new area of life, actually moving to Boston, was I was like, wait, I see wisdom over here. And the scriptures tell me that I should treat this like a massive pile of gold and gemstones. Like, I would be a fool to just let that go and continue on with my life. And Jesus has a similar idea of like the pearl of great value, the treasure hidden in the field, that we should be looking for that. And specifically, I want to phrase it as search for commandments to obey, not just doctrines to assent to. We can all acknowledge that Jesus said love our enemies, and we, most of us likely wouldn't be joining the military, most of us likely wouldn't be going and fighting for king and country, all that good stuff. We've assented to this doctrine, but that's different than actually tangibly obeying love your enemy in the moment, here and now. And so... The idea is that we're not just looking for doctrines that we can assent to, but looking for commands to obey. What does love your enemy mean practically? Who is your enemy here and now? Who are the people that are annoying, that grate on you? What does it mean to love them? And so what does anybody have any sort of commands that they've been able to fall back on that have been a continual source of challenge and encouragement and that you can continually return to? I have a few examples, but if anyone has some, feel free to share them. Because it's very useful to have a bank of commands that never, never runs dry, so to say. So that when you're feeling dry, you can go back to these and wait a second. There's always more to this command. Um, Dom raised his hand. Give to the one who asks. Give to the one who asks. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek and you will find. All of the what's Count that? All joy when you're in tribulations. Count it all joy when you. Um, run into various tribulations. And it's good to, st- I'll get to you, it's good to actually write some of these down and have a list because at some point your spiritual life will turn dry and at some point you might be like those in Isaiah who are saying, I'm seeking God, I'm seeking your face and God's saying, yeah, but you're not doing it the way I would have you do it. Like what are some commands that as soon as you, those if-then statements, if you count it all joy, if you seek first the kingdom of God, then your light will blossom. Um, Joshua. Do unto others as you would have done unto you. You guys are hitting some of my main examples. <laughs> Dom. Anyone who doesn't do what they do. Yeah. Absolutely. And again, Jesus is the cornerstone. He's the beginning and the end of all of what discipleship means. But we don't want to just turn into like red letter Christians where it's like only Jesus' words matter, the rest of scripture. Like go through the epistles and start finding commands in there. One of them is do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in all lowliness count others more significant than yourself. Look to the interests of others. That's a command that I've relied on over and over and over. And it's like the command that keeps on commanding, so to say. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. And again, the reason we want to like start making some of these verses is because the more we start obeying them, the more we get propelled into knowledge of God. Um, Seek first the kingdom was actually the command that in my testimony that was like, am I gonna take this literally or not? Am I gonna put this first or not? And that was the command that drove me to start making a lot of more radical decisions in my life. And so I think that that's a fantastic verse to have in your back pocket. When you're going through life, when you're going through maybe seasons of dryness, seasons of find, like trying to find God, seek first his kingdom. And what does that actually mean? Because again, if somebody on the street who you're discipling is asking you, like it says, seek first the kingdom, like that sounds super weird. What's all this talk? Like, what does that mean? How would you explain that to them? And again, I'll open the, the floor. What does it mean to seek first the kingdom? Dumb. Start to walk as Jesus 
Strive to walk as Jesus walked. That's a good. Strive to walk in obedience to Jesus. Care more about what? Care more about it than anything else. And again, this gets to the idea of purity of heart, single-mindedness. Go way out of your comfort zone. Go way out of your comfort zone. I love it. Take, make his priorities your priorities. Beautiful. Did you hear that? Make his priorities your priorities. We see that's what Jesus does with the Father. Um, I do nothing except what he tells me. I can do nothing except what I see the Father doing. Like this idea of whatever the Father does, I do. Those are my priorities. That's how I live my life. And in this chain of headship that Paul lays out, Christ is our head. And so we apply that to Christ. Whatever I see Christ doing, whatever I think are his intentions, whatever are his commands, those are my purposes. And that's like at the heart of what it means to be a disciple. Here, I would say to avoid luxury and try to live in scarcity. Okay, avoid luxury and live in scarcity. We're actually going to touch back on that, so hold that thought. Um, here's a definition that I found at least helpful. Um, it comes from a man named James Hunter. He wrote a book called To Change the World. Um, and his definition, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. This is what his definition is. To seek to integrate the very order of the heavens within our personal lives and relationships, our families, our work, and leisure, and our communities. To seek to integrate the very order of the heavens within our personal lives and relationships, families, work, leisure, communities. And you get this beautiful picture with that because it's not something... Actually, I'll phrase it this way. It involves us looking up, continually putting ourselves out of the comfort zone. There still might be more that we don't know. It's like this picture of Moses on the mountain. He sees the tabernacle, and then he's supposed to take that beautiful heavenly picture and build it on earth. And I think that's a good starting place for what it means to seek first the kingdom. Um, We see what God's purposes are through our obedience. We know who he is. We know what he wants, and we take those purposes up there, and we bring them down to our life in any and every aspect that we can find. Family, work, leisure, community, church, anything and everything. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So the idea is that there should be nothing in life, ideally, that you would be doing differently in order to pursue God more fully. I think that's a powerful statement. There should be nothing in life that you would be doing differently if you were to pursue God fully. Just gonna let that there. Oftentimes there's like something of like, okay, if I was like a super Christian or if I was like super on fire or I'll get to that at some point, there shouldn't be that. That's the ideal. That's what Jesus is calling us to. Um, there was a brief time where I was, I mean, wild story, you can ask me about it later, but I was briefly interested in like one of the high churches with all of the craziness and it's a whole other story, but I remember thinking like, if I ever do that, like I'm going to become a monk, I'm going to do the most, the most, the, the best thing I could do to get as closest to God as possible. Like I will go all out. And I think that's like, I've seen a lot of blessing from that mentality, And Lord willing, like that's the place where I find myself. And there's always things to do and tinker and like change. But like broad scale, like looking at life, Lord, like the hope is that you can say, I am trying my best and I'm trying my best to seek first the kingdom. There's nothing that I would be doing differently. So seek first the kingdom is a fantastic verse to fall back on for this continuous discipleship, this continual learning more and more about God. And the second one, Joshua had mentioned it. Do unto others as you would have do unto yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. A lot of times that's treated as like the child's command. You put it on the refrigerator and it's how you teach kids to be nice to other kids and not, you know, steal their tricycle or something. But he says that on that and loving God with all your heart, mind, and soul, hang the entirety of the law and the prophets. And so it's more than just the child command. You can say, like, that's part of the beginning and the end, like the Alpha, the Omega, of the commands of God. Loving your neighbor as yourself, and that's the commandment. That's another one of these commandments 
that's the command that keeps on commanding. Any given day, I'm walking to the post office, I'm going to the grocery store, I see something happen. Always and every moment, there's a way to love your neighbor as you would have done unto yourself. In any interpersonal interaction in church, love your neighbor as you would have done unto yourself. Do you, would you want the benefit of the doubt being given to you? Most of us would like that. Flip it. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Would you like to be listened to? Would you like to be heard out with your ideas most of the time? Yes. You flip it and you do that to someone else. And so loving your neighbors yourself is one of these other commands that keeps on commanding. So I want to just pause. Where are we at so far? Radical discipleship is the way that we know God. Action comes and then knowledge. And if this is a continuous process, then it's really, really good for us to have verses. And again, like memorize them, put them in your back pocket, put them in your shirt pocket, whatever it takes to have these verses when you're in a dry season of life so that you can fall back on them and be like, oh, wait, I'm in a dry season of life. I'm seeking God, but he's not being found. Go back to Isaiah. If you do this, then this. If you start loving your neighbors yourself again, if you start not caring about the morrow, if you intentionally put anxiety away, like all of these ifs that Jesus gives, the promise is that to the degree that we do that, Jesus will reveal himself to us. And at the end of the day, when you're really, really, really struggling, there's a really helpful question. What is one thing that I've done today because Jesus said do it? I'm just processing that. What is one thing I've done in this past season of life simply because Jesus said do it? Alternatively, what is one thing that I haven't done because Jesus said, don't do that? The more we can live in intentional discipleship is the more that we get to know God and the more we get to move forward and be transformed. Degree of glory to degree of glory. So, all this to say that discipleship isn't arbitrary. It's not like this list of commands and we have to do them, otherwise God's going to like hit us with a hammer. It's actually the means of knowing God. God, as a Loving Father is the creator of all humanity in his image, wants people to come into fellowship with him, and he's given us not only a way, but the way to do that, Jesus. And Jesus tells us the way to do it with him is obedience and love, and it's the same thing. So, the next point that I want to make is radical discipleship is not just obeying commands, but walking as he walked. And someone had mentioned that earlier in this idea of what does it mean to know God. It's walking as he walked. And if you think about it this way, Isaiah could have given us most of, if not all, of the commands that Jesus gave us. He could have said the Sermon on the Mount. He could have, it's almost like in Islam, you have Muhammad, he comes down and gives you this new list of commands, you follow it, you're good to go. And that's not what we see with Christ. Commands are part of his life, and we're supposed to walk as he walked. And so commands are a great place to start, and oftentimes they're the place to start. But discipleship is more than just taking in information. It's following after the pattern of your master. So really, and I don't know what you guys have all talked about this week, but really going into the gospel, really going into the heart of Christ and saying, why does he do the thing he does there? What, what's going through his mind? Jesus says that I don't just call you slaves, I don't just call you servants, and the reason he says that is because I've made known to you why I'm doing what I'm doing. I've made known to you the will of God, and so because of that, I call you friends. He doesn't just give detached information and say, do it. That may be the starting place, but as you grow, you start to know more about who he is. And so, it's a really good exercise, again, to go through the Gospels and start seeing the actions that he does and saying, what is going on here? Why is he doing the thing he's doing? Um, and nowhere do we see that more potently than in the cross. We see, take up your cross. We see, like, these commands, take up your cross. But what does that actually mean? We can't just learn that through speaking. We can't just learn that through knowledge. It's like this waterfall. It's like the ray of light coming through the shed. Take up your cross. The only way we know how that works and what that means is because Jesus did it for us, and he shows us what it means. And so, I want to get to 
we're running slightly low on time, want to get to this potentially final point that radical discipleship is not asceticism. And I know that's going to be potentially controversial. I know you could brought up like the luxury stuff, and I think that's a huge part of it. And you could say radical discipleship is not just asceticism, but hear me out. Um, let's see. Actually, Colossians 2.18 says, Do not let anyone who delights in false humility or asceticism, the worship of angels, disqualify you. Such a person goes into great detail about what they have seen. They're puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They've lost connection with the head from whom the whole body grows, supported and held together. So, and again, there's a huge place for denying yourself. I don't want you to mishear me, but denying yourself for what? Why are you doing these things? If you see Jesus on the, like when you see Jesus on the cross and faith in the scriptures, he's not doing it for himself. Jesus did not die on the cross for himself. What was he doing on the cross? He was denying self for the sake of other. I think that's a huge point. Christ was denying self for the sake of other. And so when it comes to um, dying to self, when it comes to these harsher commands of Christ that are probably some of the most important commands he gives, there's a reason behind it. And if we get stuck just in that idea of like, I'm going to deny self, I'm going to be selfless, I'm going to, like, there's a lot of self focused on that. It's still putting your attention on yourself. And the end of it is vanity, emptiness, it's nothing. But if you give up things for other, that's what we see, like, we see the image of love is Christ dying on the cross for us. That's a whole different idea. That's a whole different ballgame. It's almost like the idea of, I don't know what you people call it, self-care. Like, oftentimes we see Jesus taking a break in his ministry, trying to go to a withdrawn place and, like, reach out to the Father and reconnect with his, not reconnect, that's a bad way to put it, but taking this break and entering into deeper and more intentional fellowship with his Father, and that's also needed. Like, we need to do that. There's a place where people will get just completely burnt out and be useless, but if you do self-care without a reason, it becomes self-love. It becomes selfishness. And so you see these two pits on either side. The Proverbs say, don't go to the left or to the right. If you're just doing asceticism for the sake of asceticism, you've lost connection to the head. You've lost connection to Christ, who does these things for others. If you do self-love, self-care, all these things for the sake of self, it becomes self-love. It just becomes selfishness, and you've lost connection with the head. And so in all of this, this is why love your neighbors yourself is so important, and what Elijah had mentioned, a huge part of radical discipleship is other-focused. In that passage we read at the beginning about what does it mean to obey or no, what does it mean to purify yourself? There's two parts of it. It says, since you've purified yourselves so that you can see God, since you've purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so we have this obedience, for a sincere love of the brethren, so we have this obedience tied with love, and that's all of this, the first clause. Since you've done this, the end goal is love one another fervently. Love one another fervently from the heart. In Paul's like church planting manual to, I think it's Timothy. It's either Titus or Timothy, but I think it's Timothy. It's a lot of like really practical advice. It's not just these general epistles to the whole church for teaching. It's specifically to a person. Like how are you going to go tend to the church in Ephesus? So there's a lot of practical advice of like elders and deacons and like just the nitty gritty of church life. But in all of that, and again, scripture safe in a certain place. He says in all of that, the aim of our charge the aim of what we're doing, the goal of what we're doing as church planters, as Christians, as all of these things, the aim of our charge is love, issuing from a sound faith, a pure conscience, a clean heart. So, we're running low on time. So I think that I want to just wrap up what I'm hoping to communicate to you. And the first idea is that radical discipleship 
is the way we know God. We don't start off by knowing God. Who has known the Father? Who has seen the Father except Christ? Like this idea that God is so other and so transcendent. He's given us a way to know him. We can't detach ourselves and learn all of these things about him and then decide, am I going to follow him? Am I going to keep being obedient? It's not how it works. The very first step is faith. So radical discipleship is the way that we even know God. The second idea is that radical discipleship is continuous. That that cap that you put on obedience, that cap that you put on um, this is too far, or even commands that you don't know yet, teachings that you haven't really internalized yet, things that you haven't discovered yet, those things are the cap of knowing God. And again, that should give us a lot of humility because if you're like me, you've grown in your spiritual life, you've seen new teachings in ways you didn't know before, and God has revealed new things, and there's a lot of people on different stages of that path. And so there should be a humility there of like, I was there too. There's still a a long way to go. So this idea of radical discipleship is continuous. I think one of the big takeaways is to like make a list of verses, either mentally or physically, of commands that keep on commanding, of things you can fall back on so that when you're seeking the face of God, when you're reading a scripture and it's completely dry, that you can rely on these commands and be like, wait a second, I'm seeking his face, I'm seeking all these things, but I'm really anxious about the Mario. I'm really nervous about what's coming ahead and it's kind of been paralyzing me. And Jesus' command has said, do not be anxious. Or wait a second, I've been seeking God, but there's this brother that I know he has something against me and there's like a lot of tension there. I should go make that right. Or seeking God and I can't find him. Okay, at least I can find my neighbor and start loving them. And I know that if I do, that Jesus will start manifesting himself more and more and more. Seeking God, oh wait, I've just been doing this whole, this whole thing of my life out of like ambition and selfish conceit. Maybe I should stop doing that or at least change the reason why I'm doing it. So have this list of verses in the background. Um, Radical discipleship is not just obeying the commands. That's the, the third point. But it's walking as he walked. So obeying the commands is the start, but why did he do these things? Why is he acting the way he is? What does it mean to take our cross? Why does Jesus, like... If you just obey the commands, you lose out on all the narrative passages of the Gospels, and that's most of the Gospels. Like, he's given us a pattern, so we're supposed to walk that way. And finally, radical discipleship, I'll put just in here. Radical discipleship is not just asceticism, it's, or not just self-denial, but it's self-denial for. Self-denial for God, for neighbor, for the church, for something else. So I think that that's, I mean, it's 4.02, so that's all the specific time that I had. I'm going to invite Clayton up to give some announcements, and then I'll give a little bit of guidance for your prayer time and, like, how to structure that, but unless you want me to do that first. Okay.